Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commodity Culture, where our goal is to make you a better investor in the commodity space. My name is Jesse Day. Before we get started, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest is a veteran trader who began his career in 1980 as one of the original market makers in the SPX trading pit at the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. He is also a teacher and mentor in trading the founder of Bubba Trading, it's Todd Horwitz. Great to have you back on the show. Jesse, always a pleasure to join you. A lot of good stuff. Yeah, well, let's start with a broad question, and that is, what are the main trends you're seeing at the moment, whether in markets, politics, or geopolitics, or all of them, that have you concerned right now? Well, I think my, my biggest concern, I've got a number of big concerns. My biggest concern is the faulty information that we're getting on the government numbers. For example, we had the CPI number, which was very hot. And again, the whole, the whole equity rally was based on they're going to cut rates. Well, there's no way that they're going to be able to cut rates if they're going to continue to report numbers like this from the ridiculous jobs numbers they report, because in 2023, 63% of the jobs that were created were government or special interest jobs. So they had no, nothing to do. The CPI is a joke because there's no way that inflation is down to 3%. That is, that is laughable. When you go to the grocery store, you tell me that you're only paying 3% more. You go to the gas station. Again, unfortunately, the CPI number is based on false information. It doesn't include enough of what we spend money on every day. Okay. Uh, then, of course, the commodities, the grain markets have been a real horrible uh, sh horror show here as we watch them continue to go lower every single day. No rally is good enough. The shorts are in total control, which, again, now, now it doesn't make sense, right? Because there's going to be, as we approach planting season, there's some farmers that aren't going to be able to plant because they're going to be planting at a loss to begin with. So they're not going to put uh, food in the ground. Now, is it the the lack of, of, of action or is it the lack of money? And I think the biggest reason is there's not a lot of new money flowing in because right now everybody's chasing the equities. And of course, we've seen this before. It will not end well. It will be pretty ugly when it happens. And of course, gold and silver continue to just churn around in, in levels. And I think they're going to go higher. But overall, they look fine. They're just, again, they're just dealing with a lot of the issues around the globe. Yeah, I want to dive into agriculture and precious metals a little bit later as well. But first, I wanted to touch on a, a comment you made recently where you said that the Federal Reserve is blatantly manipulating markets. Talk to us about what you're seeing there. Well, you know, when you the first thing is, is free markets should trade free. OK, so a buyer and a seller should meet and exchange wealth. Well, the interest rate market has been one that has been manipulated or controlled by the Federal Reserve since Alan Greenspan, okay? He is the original bubble builder, we'll call him, and he did not do a good job at handling the situation because asset classes will price themselves. And there was never a reason to go to zero interest rate, and there's there's no reason to try to keep them low. The, the market will tell you what the correct rate of interest is. The market will price itself, but because of what the Federal Reserve has done, they have created a lot of this artificial inflation. They have created a, a situation that the middle class bars are going higher, which means there's less there's there's less above the middle class line and a lot more below now. And it's getting worse because their manipulation of rates for no reason is is ridiculous. So you're you're gonna see, I think, a housing collapse because of what they've done. Because I'm seeing it now. You have new construction that are making deals now before they're even building there because they're stuck. They own the land, they own the land, they're partially built. They're actually giving money at cheaper rates than you can get from a bank right now because they're afraid. Now, again, it may not happen tomorrow. You know, this is a presidential election cycle, which is very rarely other than 2008. That's the last time I can remember a down market during that cycle. And the Fed can do a lot to try to keep those markets higher. So I think their, their overall manipulation of rates has been very bad for the economy. It's really been taking away more money because they called it the hidden tax of inflation, right? This is like the Boston Tea Party. We're taking money 
out of uh, other ways that you can't really see it. So it's truly not new taxes, but it really is taxes because it's money out of your paycheck that you're spending more. And it's a, it's a big problem. You also discussed on your program, Bubba's Bottom Line, that the Biden regime is extorting Americans as they laugh all the way to the Ukraine bank. I believe we just saw another package of aid get approved for Ukraine. Um, how do you see all this playing out? It seems like they have an unlimited amount of money to pour into a war that, that most Americans don't even know anything about. Well, first of all, it's a war that should have never happened, number one, and 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 certainly it is a war of attrition of American assets because, of course, we have a tax base that the government's not afraid to keep tapping into the tax base. They're not afraid to build this deficit that is, I think, stands at $34 trillion. Now, I know that's a big number, but the inflation is part of it, right? It's just like the Dow at 40000 You know, these numbers, when I first started trading, the Dow was eight hundred. So, But in the meantime, it's more of a scam. It's more for the lobbyists. It's more for the companies that will benefit because let, let's face it, the new Democratic Party that is in power today doesn't want to have capitalism. They don't want an America that just has some ingenuity. You can see by the shift over of all to our service business. So let's give the money to Ukraine because our lobbyists and our politicians will make extra money by feeding these dollars. Because in my opinion, the whole political system in the United States is broken down. And you have a lot of money going to people that it shouldn't be going to, and it's being directed to them, not by true, a better product or a job, but the war is going on for no reason. The, the, the lack of aid to Israel, for example, which is our number one ally and our most trusted ally, uh, has been really torturous trying to give them some help. So it's been a real problem, but the money goes to where President Biden and crew can benefit. Well, talk to us about your forecast for the U.S. economy, because obviously we see a lot of polarization on, on social media that America is falling apart. Obviously, politically, things are extraordinarily divided. But other people have pointed out that actually industry and business in the U.S. is is very strong through all of this. So I'm wondering what your take is. Well, I don't know how you can get it strong considering you look at all the layoffs. I mean, Amazon laid off people during Christmas. How strong? Again, the one thing we know about numbers, number numbers never lie. Only the people that report them do. OK, so. I mean, I think the economy is is a major catastrophe. Again, I go back to that line, right? If the, the upper part, they're not affected. They're benefiting from this because of the inflation of their assets. Let's face it. About 15% of the population has enough money in the stock market, for example, to make a difference. So, yes, they're benefiting. In the meantime, the destruction of everybody below them continues. This is not, if you remember President Obama with, well, Joe the plumber and the money will trickle down. Well, somehow it never trickles down past the upper, the upper top percentage. And again, I'm not against capitalism. I'm against fixing the system so that you can become a communist nation or a Marxist nation and not allow the people to have ingenuity and work off of capitalism to make themselves better. And I think this is what they're doing. So yes, some of the big companies are doing very well, but that's not how America was built. America was built with small companies that grew to big companies. Steve Jobs in a garage, Jeff Bezos went broke a couple of times. Dell, n name any big company. They started somewhere and the, with all the regulations and rules and the cost of doing business now, they've eliminated the opportunity for small business to really succeed in this country. Well, let's talk about the broad market here. The S&P and NASDAQ keep making all-time highs. You know, there is a chorus pounding the table saying that it's all going to collapse. And yet here we are. What is driving the broad market at the moment. Obviously, it's a handful of, of stocks, the Magnificent Seven, some say Magnificent Five now. Um, is this being driven mostly by institutional inflows, by fund managers trying to meet their benchmarks? Is, is this driven by a retail frenzy? What What is driven the, the broad market and this handful of stocks to such high valuations? And is there a big correction on the other side of this? I think it's it's a little bit of everything. Uh, I, I think that there is a big correction on the horizon. But again, I don't want to say when. I mean, listen, I've been on record and I'm not afraid of it. I've said for the last year or so 
that I think we're going to get a 50 to 60 percent haircut. And I still believe that. Again, it's going to take time. I think the warning signs are coming clear each and every day, right? We went through this in 08, okay? But it didn't just come in 08. The magic day wasn't October of 08. The crash of 87 wasn't the magic of, of October 19th. The, the clock collapse in 2000 just didn't show up. There was a lot of warning signs that people continue to ignore. And we continue to ignore the lack of people working. We continue to ignore that these markets are way out overvalued now. We continue to ignore the troubles in this country, the debt in this country. I mean, credit card debt has never been higher. And I'm not talking about dollar amounts because, again, we go back to that inflation issue. But there's never been more people at limit on their credit card paying the minimum ever in history. So how are they ever going to get out? So, again, what you have here is you have a lot of warning signs. Emergency lending window at the Federal Reserve is has never been more crowded with banks borrowing money. I don't think that the banks could pass a legitimate stress test should they be given a real one from an independent accounting firm. I think that it'll blow up the same way it blew up in the past. It'll be through the banks, okay? It'll be through the financial institutions that are dramatically over leveraged, and we'll see. But again, you're now you're in that funny time of the year, right? We got a political cycle. You've got the Fed that's, that's talking, but when it's all done, one day there's going to be somebody on Meet the Press, as Paulson was in, in 2008 in September, saying everything's okay, okay? Just like in, in 1929, you had announcements. Everything's good. We're in great shape. And what happened? Well, I expect the same. I don't know that it'll be tomorrow. I don't know it'll be a year from now, but the warning signs are very clear throughout the market from the, the banking system to the, the government system, to everything else that we do, there's nothing that I can say, boy, this is really positive. Well, I'd like to go through some commodities with you now and get your take. Let us know if you're bullish, bearish, or, or neutral, and time horizon will be by the end of 2024, how you think these commodities are going can to Can I give perform. you the I'm crying ones too, the ones that I own that I'm, yes. because I'm. <laughs> yes, and, and let's start with gold. Gold, I'm bullish. I mean, right now, full, I'll give you a full disclosure because it's, it's, it's a tricky question. I own a lot of physical, okay? Right now, I am short the board because the trend is lower, okay? But over the long haul, I'm very bullish gold. I think gold will, I think gold will make new highs this year at some point, okay? But right now, today, as we're speaking, I am short on the board, but I'm always not long because I own physical, okay? And just for everybody out there, when you invest in gold, if you're investing for your long term, make it physical, not paper, because I don't believe there's enough paper. I don't believe there's enough gold in the world to cover the amount of paper that's out there. Yes, I've been stacking gold recently, too. I mean, it's it's just a way to store your wealth outside of the financial system. I see that as just that alone being such a valuable um, way to protect and store your wealth. Uh Let's talk about silver now. Bullish, bearish, or neutral by the end of 2024, and how are you positioned? I'm same as gold. I am short right now, but I do own a lot of physical. So again, I'm still net long, but as a trader, I'm short. I expect silver. Now again, I was wrong last year. I thought silver would get into the 30s. Okay, I think this year it will get into the 30s again. I think, but again, right now it's very weak. Okay. And it's hard to get anything going, which you'll see this is a common theme through a lot of the commodity spaces because, of course, a lot of the new money is going into equities. But I am bullish, but at the moment I am short. So obviously for now, I'm bearish. Long term, I'm bullish. And I expect higher prices. Oil. Oil, I am confused. Okay. Now this is a, uh, I am short oil at the moment, uh, but I think it'd be very close to, to turning. Uh, but the weakness in the economy tells me that oil is going lower because I think when, when OPEC and Saudi Arabia are not trying to cut production to force prices higher, they are saying that they recognize that the United States is in a, an economic meltdown position. And if they force oil higher, it'll drive their business much lower. So I think there's a problem there. I, I would think that you know, under normal circumstances, it was a good economy. I think oil would be soaring higher. But because of the economy, I think oil is, I'm bearish oil, but I am a little bit confused because there's too many factors that don't make sense. The chart itself is really telling you that oil is stuck between 70 and 78. 
And how about natural gas? Natural gas looks like it's going to zero, which means it's probably time to buy. We're short and I've been short, but I did my Monday call and I said that if you're looking to take a shot, you know, $1.60 is probably, you know, there's not as much risk as $1.60 as there was when it was three forty, dollars right? Uh, I would only be a buyer. I am shorted, okay? And will change when the trend changes. But if I were going, going to buy, put new money to work now, I'd only be a buyer. In fact, I was looking at it and will potentially might buy some today as a trade because it's getting hammered again. And how about copper? Copper is another one that kind of confuses me because, again, it be, because of its use, its industrial use in the building and, the, and, and things for homes and things like that, uh, we're short copper. Uh, I think copper should go much lower, okay? Uh, but again, it has held up remarkably well, especially into the face of the economy. Uh, but I would suspect that it would go lower, and I would rather be short copper than long copper right now. And do you invest in the uranium market at all? And what, what are your thoughts there? I don't play it. There really isn't a good way to play it other than through some of the ETFs. Uh, I'm assuming it's a good market. Uh, but again, you have, to, you have to always weed out when it gets too far overbought. Okay. If I were trading the uranium market on a regular basis, I would look for spots where it got oversold, where they said, oh, the deal's it's not going to work. We're not going to use it. It's not going to be that magic new thing for batteries or whatever, you know, whatever. Uh, but it's not a market that I follow because there is not really an accurate futures market that trades it. And do you look at nickel at all? I do not. Again, basically, I'll look at the trades that I can trade, uh, you know, platinum, gold, silver, uh, nickel. I, I don't trade at all. So I don't have a real feel for it. I don't have a handle for it. I, you know, I, I can always give you a view. If you'd like, I can, I can look at a chart and tell you what I would think about it. But I don't typically look at it. Well, tell us about what your thoughts on platinum then. I love platinum here. I, I, I don't understand why it continues to get beaten into, into oblivion. Okay. Uh, I've been a buyer every time it's dipped down to below 900. I've been a buyer. I buy a lot of physical. And again, if I look at it from history, it's on sale because it used to be higher than gold and now it's less than half of gold. So my, my suspicion is it's going to go higher. Now, the one problem with the platinum markets for people who trade is they're a little bit thinner than than most markets right but i do like platinum and i would certainly be a buyer down here at these levels which at uh you know 878 is probably a pretty good price to to step in and take a shot certainly if you're going to buy physical i would not have any problem at buying at these levels and uh run through any of the agricultural commodities that you're you're currently involved in whether that's grains um any other uh subsets of agriculture that that you think either present an opportunity or perhaps you're you're bearish on well, we're short the grain markets. Okay. Now, again, I don't necessarily like being short the grain markets here. Uh, in fact, I have one account that I own. I bought some corn in. Okay. Cause I don't, I just don't see it. Now I'm long and short corn, right? But you know, one's more active than the other. The, the one I'm long, I'm like a farmer. I'm willing to put it in my own bin right now and I'll hold on to it. Okay. Uh, but again, they don't look good. Every time you see a rally, they get sold into. The shorts are in full control here in the grain markets. Uh, it doesn't make sense, but of course, you've got a lot of competition from South America now. And I think that this year, though, as we get near planting season, I think there's a lot of farmers that aren't going to plant because right now, depending on how much you can produce, there are solar companies offering $1,500 an acre as, le as a lease payment to, to put their panels in and tell you not to plant. Okay. So I think if I look longer term, I think we see these markets turn around later. Okay. And they soar higher because I think there's going to be a shortage of food. Okay. So that those markets, I'm very, I'm short now, but long term, I'm bullish. Okay. Uh, the cattle markets, you know, there was a shortage in cattle, which pushed prices higher. The prices of hell. Now, this is against everything I teach, everything I do, but I am short cattle. Okay, and will remain short cattle and continue to sell it because I don't know who can afford to buy it. Okay, I don't know the average consumer going to the store who's going to be able to buy it. Now, again, it's held up. These work very close to all time highs. Uh, and the last time we did this was which was about 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, I said the same thing. I'm selling and I'll take my chances. I'm going to continue to sell them and I will continue to sell and be short them because I do not think that the markets can support this. I don't think the economy can support them. And so I would look to be a seller there. And I think people want protein. So the, the trade to me would be short cattle, long hogs. Okay. Because again, the, the divergence between the two, I would be a player. 
The softs have gone totally into whack job. Uh, cocoa is at all, it keeps making new all time highs. Uh, sugar, I mean, cotton has found, I, I think, a bottom. Okay. I think it found the bottom at 79 cents. Uh, sugar, you know, again, I think it's between 23 and 25. I mean, I, we, we have a long position in it right now. I have a long position in cotton. I have a long position in cocoa. Uh, OJ, which has been wild. Have you ever seen a market like that? I mean, right now we're shorted again. Uh, and I, I, again, I don't, I think OJ is going back much lower. I think it'll go half of where it is right now, but it has been extremely strong. It got over $4 a number of times. And coffee, I think, is a, is a, is a bot. Okay, so I think coffee will will head higher. But again, a lot of these things will depend on the general overall economy. You know, when it's all said and done, if I'm right about the economy, then all these products have to fall first before they can go much higher than here because people aren't going to be able to buy them. It's going to mean oversupply. The only difference is those markets from a trading standpoint are much thinner and much more illiquid to really trade into. And aside from all the commodities we've just discussed, is there anywhere else in the market you're seeing value? It could be commodities. It could be a different type of asset. Um, are you looking at emerging markets at all? Get, give us your thoughts on where else you're seeing value at the moment. You know, I don't, I, honestly, other than the grain markets, as far as value, uh, gold and silver, I don't see a lot of value. Uh, even the cryptocurrency world, which, you know, again, that is still a commodity in my book. Uh, I think that the, they're getting a little bit pricey right now as well, too, with the, exp the big expansion here. Uh, I, I don't think that there is anything of dramatic value right now that I would have to go out and reach to, nor want to buy. Because I, you have to remember one thing. If I am correct on what I expect to happen, then the benefit factors will be the grain markets in gold and silver, and the rest will fall, whether it's cheap now or not. Because remember... The markets, even though there's some funny business that goes on, the markets are still going to price those asset classes. And I don't want to start chasing, you know, like China. I think China is in massive trouble, okay? I think China got tired of having a middle class. And I think a lot of their fault and problem is destroying it on purpose, okay? But we'll see, you know, but Evergrande is going to go kablooey. And uh, I don't see a lot of value that of, of things that have not already been reached to the sky that I'd want to jump to right now. And what about areas of the market that you think it's important to avoid? Obviously, you mentioned China there, not a place you'd want to put capital in. Um, perhaps some of the battery metals or things related to the, the green revolution. Um, where, where at the moment, obviously, the broad market. Are, are you short or long the broad market? What, what are your thoughts there? Well, I'm always not um, long the, the broad the market. Year. I am long the broad market now anyways, uh, because, but because of my core portfolio and my retirement, my profit sharing, everything else is always long and hedged. I'm always hedged though, too. Okay. I use derivatives to hedge my portfolio to a mathematical certainty. But I think that, again, I, I think the EV market's falling apart. Okay. I think the green energy is falling apart. So I wouldn't want to be an investor in those things right now, because I think you've seen, if you go across the globe where all this started, if you remember when they went to the big climate accord and, and President Trump pulled out, or, oh, how could you do that? Well, now nobody's in it anymore. They've all pulled out, including France and Germany. And Germany's in big trouble. So Germany's in trouble. The EU's in trouble. China's in trouble. South America's in trouble. I don't see anywhere where there's a place to rest. And I think your best place right now is in safe assets and in, 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 in liquid capital that you can get a hold of, okay? Any asset class that you're willing to invest in right now, you better be prepared that it better be liquid because if you get involved in, in things that are not liquid, you can't get out. And if you have to get out, you're not going to be happy with the price that you get. So before I let you go, let's just dive a little bit into your own trading strategy and I'd like to try to understand how you decide to go short or long. What are the main indicators you look at? Obviously, you've been a trader for a very long time. This might get into something very technical that, that your average layman, including myself, might not be able to understand. But from kind of a, a basic level, as easily as you can explain it, what are the indicators that you look at um, to decide whether to go short or long something? Well, I, I have an algorithm that we've written, okay, that d determines long or short the market. But just for the average guy, average girl on the street wants to look at trading, learn how to look at a chart, okay? And the market really breaks down into three basic phases. There is the congestion or consolidation phase where the markets are going sideways, right? They're going up and down. They reach a certain level to the top side. Then new money sellers come in, push it down to the bottom. Then new money buyers come in and they rotate 
and they go sideways. Eventually, that consolidation will end and the markets will pick a direction. They'll either break out to the upside and trend higher or they'll break to the downside and trend lower. As a trader, you know, we're not, you're not a floor trader. So as a retail trader, you want to try to find the trend. It's too hard to make capital if you're trying to counter trend the market because, again, there's too much movement. Of course, costs become a, a factor. So you look, you want to find the breakout. Okay. And once the market breaks out, either up or down, you then want to participate and jump on with that. And so that, that's the second phase of the market is the breakout to a trend. And usually markets will end in what they call a blow off fashion where price and time become irregardless. And either the buyers are buying them with FOMO and chasing them straight up or the panicking selling is puking them out. And of course, you can watch the volatility index known as the VIX because there's some very good pointers to watch. For example, if the market is going higher and the VIX is also going higher, the market is probably reaching a top. Okay. If the market is going lower and the VIX is going lower, the market is probably reaching a bottom. Okay. And you can look at these over and over again. It happens over and over again. Now, it doesn't mean immediate. The other thing I would tell people is just don't try to predict the market. Forget about what the news tells you. The news is already priced in that chart. Everybody knows what the news is. So if you're going to try to play the news, you're always going to be a, a beat late. You must let the market footprint give you an idea where to get involved in the market, either side, long or short. Okay. And you cannot go in with a predisposed determination just because the economy stinks right now that you have to be short because it's proven with a lousy economy, the markets have gone up 35% since October. Yeah, great words of wisdom there. And time horizon for yourself, what sort of time horizons are you trading? Are you literally doing multiple trades within a day? Is it a bit longer than that? Um, how, how do you approach that? That's a good question. I trade live every day with my members for an hour in the morning. I day trade. Uh, you know, I might make 50 trades or 100 trades in a day on a day trading basis. I swing trade, which means those trades can last for days, weeks, months. Okay. And of course, I own a core long term position as well. So it really depends on what you're trying to do. Investors should be buying equities, for example, that they think are good companies that are going to be in business for the next 10 years for sure. Because let's face it, no matter what I tell you, the markets have proven that they go up eight and a half percent year over year in history. OK, there'll be a sell off, but you have to be able to withhold. So don't over invest whenever you invest in. Don't over invest where you're going to panic out if it goes against you, because if everything is still the same, sometimes things react to the market. So but again, I can trade. There's trades I will hold. I mean, we've been, for example, long the equities for for four months OK, and have not reversed out. So, again, sometimes it's more often. But again, it's a day trade, which I'm using a four minute cycle or a swing trade, which is using a daily algorithm. And of course, my investments are hedged with my uh, using options to hedge them to a mathematical certainty. So I don't even think about those. And I don't trade those. I just keep adding to them. Great. Well, Todd, this has been an amazing conversation. Extremely fascinating. I learned a ton. Uh, for those who do want to learn more about your methodology, tell us about Bubba Trading, what it is you do there and where people can find it. Well, BubbaTrading.com is where you can find it. We educate traders. We teach, you know, again, I, I teach uh, basically. And we, we, again, I'm trying to help you be a better trader, be a better investor. I've been very fortunate. I've been doing this for 45 years and I'd like everybody to have the opportunity to either be a better investor, a better trader or both. And if you, if you don't mind for your audience, I do have a, one of my books I've written, which is on Amazon, but I'm happy to give it to your audience for free, a PDF file. So if anybody, if you want a copy of my Bubba's Guide to Trading Options, you can email me at Bubba at BubbaTrading.com and I'll be happy to send you that book as, as a gift for, for my friend, Jesse. Great. Well, I'll put a link to the email address as well as BubbaTrading.com in the description below. Thanks once again, Todd, for coming on and sharing your knowledge with the audience. Great to be with you, Jesse. I appreciate it. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.